Good evening. Good evening, everyone. If you could grab a seat, we'll begin the evening's uh, presentation. If you could turn off your cell phones, or at least uh, put them on vibrate, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, I'm Dan McDonough. I'm Director of Honors Programs here at UTM, and I'd like to welcome you to our final academic speaker of the 2009-2010 year. Uh, we're going to have a great evening tonight because our speaker tonight is doubling as the Sigma Xi uh, banquet speaker. So Sigma Xi and Dr. S.K. Airy uh, should be congratulated for bringing our speaker here tonight. Dr. Peoples uh, received bachelor's degrees in mathematics and chemistry from Montclair State University in New Jersey and a doctorate in physical organic chemistry from Purdue University. He's been working for uh, nearly 25 years now in the carpet industry and has been at the forefront of the establishment of standards and sustainability in that industry. Dr. Peoples <clears throat> is the director of the American Chemistry Society's uh, Green Chemistry Institute, and that's an organization that he's belonged to for 35 years now, uh, often at the forefront in uh, sustainability and innovation. He also currently serves on California's Green Ribbon Science Panel and as a member of the Chemical Sciences Roundtable at the National Academies of Science. He's previously served as Sustainability Director for the Carpet and Rug Institute, Executive Director of the Carpet America Recovery Effort, and President of the Environmental Group. For his efforts and achievements, he was named Person of the Year in 2003 by the Carpet America Recovery Effort. Let's join in giving a big hand to tonight's academic speaker and Sigma Xi Banquet speaker, Dr. Bob Peoples. Thank you, Dan. Welcome, Bob. Well, good evening. Mic's on? Great. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I had a great drive from uh, Memphis a little earlier today, and Fortunately, I wasn't diverted by your lovely weather, so I'm glad to be here tonight and to share some thinking about what our future might look like. Before we get started, I'd like to kind of survey the audience. Can you raise your hand if you're associated with the engineering sciences? Okay. How about chemistry? Great. Biology? Business? Other disciplines? Oh, wow, we have a whole, what are, what are some of these other disciplines? Nursing? Okay, what are some of the other disciplines we got here? What is it? Pre-vet. Pre -vet. Pre Natural resource management. Okay, great. Well, we have, how about the business school again? Okay, we got a couple from the business schools. Okay, well, what I'm going to try to do tonight is I'm going to try to make this um, discussion generally applicable to everybody. And I use the word discussion by choice because... Um, I get excited and I get going, but I could go for three hours. But I, what I really want to do is encourage you that if I say something up here tonight that you don't agree with uh, or that you have a question about, I'm going to offer you the opportunity to interrupt me, and we'll try to deal with that in an efficient fashion. But you don't have to wait till the end of this conversation. So if you look at this slide, it's kind of an interesting contrast. I put it up there because it compares uh, a picture of a physical plant which we do chemical manufacturing in. And I have a picture of a tree, which I consider nature's biochemical reactor, an ideal biochemical reactor, if you will. And what I'd like to do is compare and contrast the two. I think it's rather interesting that we choose to use the word plant to describe our chemical manufacturing operations. Yet if you think about a chemical manufacturing plant versus a nature's bioreactor, the two are nothing alike. So for example, in, in uh, man-made operations, we typically run reactions at high temperature, sometimes at low temperature, sometimes at high pressure, and it requires energy to accomplish those conditions, right? And energy means we've got to burn fuels to generate power. It means uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We typically run our transformations in organic solvents, and we usually produce a fair bit of waste. In fact, we're going to talk a little bit more waste later on tonight. Compare that to the way nature does her chemistry. Nature does chemistry most often at room temperature, slightly higher sometimes in biological systems, virtually always at atmospheric pressure, and in water. So 
I, ideally in nature, there are no waste generated. So that's the model we aspire to, is to do chemistry the way nature does chemistry. So let's, let me give you a sort of a thumbnail sketch of what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on global perspectives. What do I think about as a scientist when I think about the challenges facing society today and how those challenges drive the development of new technology, new chemistries, new engineering to solve these problems of sustainability going forward. And then we'll talk specifically about um, sustainability, what's the definition, and how green chemistry and green engineering can be applied to solve some of these problems going forward. The other thing I want to say to you is that sustainability is also a, a, a journey that we aspire to sometime in the future. And it's, it's a long-term commitment. It'll take us many generations to get there. And oh, by the way, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. We do not have all the answers today. We've just taken the first steps. And it's going to take a rich dialogue amongst all the peoples of this planet to solve the problems. And by the way, there are no silver bullets. There's no one size fits all. What works as a solution here in Martin, Tennessee, probably isn't going to be the ideal solution over in Beijing, China, or down somewhere in South America. So you have to have an appreciation for the lo local geography as you tackle these problems going forward. What I really want to do tonight is share with you information. I like numbers, so I'm going to share some numbers with you. I want to stimulate your thinking about those numbers and, in fact, start building these bridges for dialogue as we tackle these tough problems going forward. So on this planet today, we have about six and a half billion people or so. That's not a surprise to anyone in this audience, but it sure came as a surprise to me when I learned that 1.2 billion people on this planet do not have access to safe drinking water. That's 20% of the population of this planet. Most people don't realize that. And right after access to safe drinking water and all the problems and challenges that portend is the fact that about 40% of the population of this planet does not have access to sanitary conditions. And the implications are pretty significant for both of these, in particular for young children, infants. Uh, the mortality rate is very high because of infections as a result of lack of sanitary conditions. And I would submit to you that the problems are going to get worse as the population continues to expand and we move to in excess of 9 billion people on this planet somewhere around the turn of this century. We also have instantaneous access to information via the Internet and people travel around the world talking to one another today. So people in the developing nations can see the quality of life and some of the uh, luxuries that we have in the developed world. And I would suggest to you that they have a desire and I would argue a fundamental human right to have access to a better quality of life. I believe we as a developed society, you as practicing scientists today, you as the future scientists of tomorrow, um, <clears throat> have an obligation to help the developing nations solve these challenging problems. Keep in mind that there are no uh, political boundaries when it, or geographic boundaries when it comes to uh, the pollution that's generated from ongoing operations in some of these developing countries. And we're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail. So the United States represents about 5% of the population of this planet, yet we know that we're a big emitter of CO2. In fact, we're number two in the world right now. Do you know who's number one? Who is it? China. China surpassed the U.S. in terms of CO2, absolute CO2 productions, pounds of CO2, in about August of 2007. So in absolute terms, they're the biggest. If you look at it on a per capita basis, the United States is still number one. We emit more CO2 per person than any other country on this planet. It's really interesting now as the, the nations negotiate things like cap and trade or carbon tax, that China has taken the position, and I find it interesting from an intellectual point of view, that most of the CO2 they generate, probably about 70% of it, is the result of manufacturing operations to make goods for sale in Europe and the United States. So it's not to service their own needs. So their argument is if there's going to be a tax on carbon, that tax should be passed back to the countries where the goods are being imported. So just think about that. That's an interesting intellectual argument. So after you talk about the United States, we could talk about China. You know, we've already said that China surpassed the U.S. in terms of CO2 emissions. What I find uh, really concerning is that China, in order to meet its expanding manufacturing base and slowly growing population, is the need to produce um, 
It's to deliver more power. And the way you deliver more power is to build new power plants. The cheapest and most abundant raw material in China is coal, much like in the United States. So China is actually bringing online uh, one new coal-fired power plant every week. The single largest source of mercury emissions today is coal from coal-fired power plants. So it would be nice if we could help develop alternative technologies to the use of coal. The other thing is, in November, I prepared a slide based on this information, and I, I found out that China was putting 14,000 new automobiles on the road every single day. Every day, 14,000 new cars. What are those cars uh, fueled by? Petroleum products, gasoline or diesel. And when you put petroleum products into an internal combustion engine, what do you do? You generate greenhouse gases, right? CO2, nitrous oxides, and such. Not good. What was really surprising to me is that was the number for November. It's no longer valid. Anybody want to guess what the number was for January of 2010? It's kind of like an auction. Do I hear 15,000? Do I hear 20,000? 30,000. Anybody want to make it 35? Sold for 35,000. Wrong. China is, at, in the month of January, put out almost 54,000 new vehicles every single day and the number is going up every single month. That's a huge source of pollution going forward. It also has big raw material implications, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. By the way, remember, it's okay to interrupt me if you want to challenge any of this. So let's talk about definitions. I like definitions because it gets us all on the same page. This is a, a generally used definition of sustainability. It was generated all the way back in 1983 by the Brundtland Commission in Europe, I like this definition because it's very easy to understand. You don't have to have a, uh, an advanced scientific degree to get it. It basically says we're going to meet our needs today without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. People in developing nations look around them and they see things are changing with their environment. And they know the changes are not for the better. And they're, they're requesting and they're starting to demand that we pay attention to some of the waste generation, the use of raw materials, the pollution of air, land, and water going forward. Those are some of the challenges that we face. What I would tell you is that the planet is sending us signals. The signals are very clear. We are not sustainable in the eyes of nature using the technology that we apply today to deliver goods and services on a global basis. In fact, said another way, we cannot achieve the needs of a growing population of this planet by the linear extension of existing technology. Therein lies the challenges for us going forward for invention, innovation, and the scale up and development and deployment of new technology, especially in developing nations, because that's where a lot of the new infrastructure and the manufacturing infrastructure is being installed today. So, let's talk a little bit more about numbers and what's going on on a global basis. First of all, a little bit more about China. China has a population of 1.3 billion people. Their GDP is growing at 8 plus percent a year. That was during the economic downturn. Prior to the downturn, they were up at around 11, 12, 13 percent, and they're probably going to head close to those numbers again going forward. There's some effort to rein that in right now. Interestingly enough, China is forecast to build 40 billion square meters of new space in the next 20 to 25 years. 40 billion square meters. I don't know about you, but I have no idea how much 40 billion square meters is. We'll come back to that in just a minute. And look at what's going to happen with respect to raw material demand as their manufacturing sector expands to meet the demands of goods and services around the world, and they build all this space. Who comes right behind China? Who's right behind China? What is it? The U.S.? Think again, a little closer to China. What is it? India. India. 
So a mega city is defined as 10 million people or more. India is expected to have 45 mega cities going forward. Again, as their manufacturing sector expands, you can see the kinds of demands on raw materials. So I sent in this international conference uh, just about a year ago, and in my notebook in big letters, I wrote the following statement. I said, this part of the world, China and India in particular, are going to command resources like we've never seen in the recorded history of this planet. In fact, I found it interesting that Airbus, the French manufacturer of aircraft, did a 15-year forward contract with Russia for titanium to ensure the supplies of that precious metal for the construction of the fuselage of their airplane, caught Boeing by surprise, and Boeing is now scrambled to secure those raw materials as well. So in addition to the social and economic challenges that we face, we have national security issues with respect to the availability of raw materials as the demand goes up. And oh, by the way, the Earth has limited resources, right? Right now, the World Watch Institute estimates that we are consuming resources at a rate that's equivalent to 40% more than this planet can sustain. So somebody said to me, well, if we're, if we're consuming faster than the planet can sustain it, how come it, you know, we already haven't had a disaster? And my, my analogy is a little bit like a bank account. You put $1,000 in, that's your big deposit, and then you keep buying stuff, buying stuff, buying stuff. All of a sudden, where you, one day your credit card gets declined because there's no more money in the account. Well, we're, we're withdrawing the, the um, resources of this planet at such a rate that at some point in time the balance will go to zero. That will have big consequences for all of mankind. And that's what we're talking about, how to resolve those problems going forward. I always feel like I have to talk about climate change. So here's a picture that many of you have probably seen. It's a picture of uh, Greenland and the, um, the surface melt over the years, to 1992 to 2005. And you, know, you can look at that and you can see, yeah, the glaciers are melting. You can talk about how fast they're melting. But let's talk about climate change. Well, what can you say about climate change? Well, you could certainly say that climate change has been going on since the beginning of time. In fact, you all know that at one point in time, this planet was not inhabitable life by life as we know it because the atmosphere was quite toxic to, to uh, living systems today. That's been going on for four and a half billion years, and it's going to keep happening. The other thing for me as a scientist, and I'm no expert on climate change, but I could tell you this, I think climate change is incredibly complex. All these systems are interconnected to one another, and we really do not fully understand climate dynamics. We work hard at developing these very sophisticated computer models, but the fact is we can't explain everything that's going on. So what do we say from there? Is man having an impact on the planet? Yeah, he probably is. Somebody asked me earlier today, how much of all the CO2 that gets, gets emitted is attributable to man? Well, I heard a number recently. I haven't validated this number, but it kind of makes sense. The estimate was we're contributing 3% to the excess carbon dioxide load going into the atmosphere. If there are any atmospheric scientists in the audience, I'd, I'd ask you to challenge me or, or direct me to the, the correct information if you don't agree with that. But clearly this is happening. We're seeing a lot of persistent organic pollutants showing up in the environment. We know some of these materials are bioaccumulating in the food chain and as a result in our bodies. So if you took a sample of adipose tissue, blood, or urine from any one of us, you'd be quite startled to learn there's probably about four or five dozen different synthetic man-made chemicals in our bodies today, okay? Because they are bioaccumulating and amplified through the food chain going forward. And then there's this whole topic of endocrine disruption, which we're probably not going to have time to get into. So let me, let me ask you to do a little thought experiment with me here. I'd like you to just kind of close your eyes for a second. And, and, and think about some place that you've been with your family, with your friends on vacation. Think about a wonderful vista that comes to mind. It may be walking along the white sands of the Gulf of Mexico. It might be skiing down the beautiful mountains in the Rockies. It might be the smells and the sounds of the rainforest. Think about those things and think about the words that you would so carefully choose to describe these wonderful thoughts and memor memories and images to your family, your friends, your loved ones. And then I'll ask you to open your eyes. And I would tell you that this is your inherent love of nature around you. 
It's built into our genes. It causes us to relax. It gives us enjoyment. And the, the Harvard biologist, Edwin Wilson, coined a phrase for this. It's called biophilia, literally meaning love of life. And it's this concept of biophilia that really is the basic driving force for why we have to tackle the problems of sustainability today. We want to preserve these wonders of nature before it's too late. So let's talk a little bit about how we might do that and maybe how the role of green chemistry and engineering can fit together. And by the way, I'm going to say green chemistry a lot. When I say green chemistry, I really mean green chemistry and green engineering because they go together. And it's not just restricted to chemistry and chemical engineering because all the sciences have to work together. We can't be in these stovepipes with, uh, with arbitrary disciplinary bounding, boundaries. It's going to take all of the sciences working together. That's why I asked if there were business people in the audience because at the end of the day, business people make the decisions that determine whether investments get made in new technology, new green technology going forward. And hopefully before the night's over, I'll give you some examples to show why green chemistry is a great return on investment. So a little bit more facts and figures. First of all, these data are from the year 2005. Just for the United States, the EPA estimates that we throw away about a half a trillion pounds of material every year. Half a trillion pounds. A good portion of that is organic matter from food waste. But the fact is, you know, we're throwing away billions of pounds of, of electronics. Today, a lot of them go to developing nations where they're disassembled for recycling purposes but not under very good conditions, and that number continues to grow. And as, as uh, you start looking at Europe and China and, and more of these products circulate in the global marketplace, the numbers continue to expand. Most of this stuff is made out of petroleum, so it doesn't make sense to pump it out of the ground, put all this energy and investment into refining these materials, and then just throwing them right back out into the landfills. I'm curious to know how many people in the audience have ever heard of the Great Pacific Gyra. Okay, a couple folks. This is an area out in the Pacific where the currents of the ocean circulating kind of come together. And you know when currents come together, typically you start to get a collection of stuff. Well, in the Pacific Ocean, there's an area where there's about 3.5 million tons of plastic materials floating around. They occupy a space about the size of Texas. And when you look at it in detail, what you see is seawater that has six times more plastic in it than there is plankton in the seawater. And, and a lot of times the albatross birds, to feed their young, what they do is they swim along the surface of the water and they look for little tiny round fish eggs and they scoop those up and they carry them back to the, to the nest. But mankind produces plastic in little tiny pellets and those pellets are indistinguishable from fish eggs. So when the albatross feed, pick up the eggs and take them back to the young, they're feeding them plastic. And what you see is many times these, these birds die on the beach from malnutrition because, um, because of all the plastic that they've ingested. And in fact, here's a larger bird, and you can see like a cigarette lighter and other plastic components that these birds have picked up and ingested, and they can't get them out of their system. You know, they don't break down inside. So these, these are environmental contaminants that are long-lasting man-made materials coming from petroleum. So how do we tackle a problem like this using green chemistry and green engineering? Well, there's a company called NatureWorks that manufactures a natural product called polylactic acid. It comes from renewable resources. It takes a whole lot less fossil fuel from an energy point of view to manufacture this stuff. We don't have to use toxic and organic solvents to produce it no hazardous materials involved, and these materials can be, in principle, recycled or composted. So, so by applying these principles of green chemistry and using nature as a guide, we can start coming up with ways to replace materials that are much more compatible with our environment. And for the chemists in the audience, you could start with um, feedstocks like corn or, or uh, wheat. In the future, we want to ship from food sources to waste material from agriculture that will feed this chain. This is a polymer called polylactic acid, and it goes into all kinds of food-related containers, bottles. Uh, you, you're probably starting to see these show up in cups and containers in the stores going forward. Maybe they've got them on the campus. I, I don't know. So let's talk again about definitions. <clears throat> Green chemistry. Green chemistry is defined as the design of chemical products and the processes to make them that reduce or eliminate 
the use or generation of hazardous substances. So what we're trying to do is do chemistry from a fundamental design point of view and make it benign by design using some of the lessons we can learn from nature. And how do we go from a definition to implementation? Well, we have 12 principles of green chemistry. And if you go into the laboratory and you, you're going to make a new molecule or a new material, if you use these principles to guide the development of that material, you can avoid some of the problems that we've created in the past. And if you look at these, there's certainly not time to go through all of them, but they make a lot of sense. Things like prevent waste, improve our energy efficiency, use renewable feedstocks. It just makes good common sense. If you uh, talk about the chemistry, we refer to these principles, but we also have a set of 12 engineering principles. So the two together give us a roadmap of how we can do things differently in the future. So let's talk about um, how do we measure improvements. If you just take this black box as a chemical process, we're going to make something. Typically, the chemist in the laboratory will put a bunch of stuff into that reactor, does some chemistry in here, a lot of times at high temperature and pressure, sometimes low temperature, and out the back end comes the product he's interested in. And historically, that's all we worried about. You know, what's it take to get it? to get started and what is the product coming out the back end. But in 1992, a chemist from the Netherlands named Roger Sheldon came up with this concept of E-Factor. He said, let's think about the other things that go into this reactor. Well, of course, there's some waste that comes out. And nowadays, everybody tries to be environmentally conscious, so we recycle as much as we can. And if we can't recycle it, we'll sell it as a byproduct. And Dr. Sheldon defined the term E-Factor as the kilograms of waste per kilogram of product produced. So how many kilograms of stuff that you don't want result from a chemical reaction per kilogram of stuff that you do want? So when you talk about an E-factor, the higher the E-factor, the worse it is, right? More non-desirable product. Well, if you did a, do an analysis of the industry, what Sheldon found was that E-factors in the pharmaceutical and the fine chemicals industry tend to be very high. For example, if you just look at 80 for the pharmaceutical industry, that means maybe they're going to manufacture a new drug and they make 80 kilograms of waste for every one kilogram of that drug that they manufacture. So that's a pretty high ratio of waste to product of interest. If you look down here at basic chemicals and oil refining, what that tells us is two things. Number one, you know, industry has gotten really good at squeezing every ounce of value out of every barrel of oil that we pump out of the ground. The difference between the two is their E-factors may be relatively low, but they produce hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds, if not billions of pounds of material. So a small E-factor times billions of pounds is still a lot of waste, right? Whereas in the pharmaceutical industry, if you make a million pounds of a, of a particular drug, that's a pretty big run for, for drugs going forward. So even a high E-factor in absolute terms doesn't produce as much waste as some of these other guys do. So. Let me give you some examples of how uh, green chemistry and engineering can solve some of these problems. And I'll go through these pretty quickly without trying to get bogged down in the chemistry. Professor Lee at the University of Oregon was walking down the beach one day, watching the waves pound on the rocks, and he saw those muscles clinging tightly to the rocks. And he said, hmm, nature has really invented a really powerful adhesive. I should be able to go into the laboratory and mimic the adhesive that nature has developed. And sure enough, he found that if he takes a naturally, rapidly renewable uh, material called soy protein, comes from soybeans, and he does a chemical modification to put some reactive groups on the end of it, he can generate a soy-based adhesive that performs better than the current adhesives used in composite wood products. So typically today, Composite wood products use urea formaldehyde or formol formaldehyde resins to glue the wood together. You find this wood most commonly in cabinets, in furniture, and in homes, especially pre-manufactured homes like trailers, right? And because the formaldehyde is used in the adhesive, there's a lot of formaldehyde emissions. And that's not good for our health because we know formaldehyde is a, is a known human carcinogen. Well, what Columbia Forest Products did was they took this material and they replaced uh, over 47 million pounds of phenol formaldehyde-based resins in their composite lumber products, and they were able to dramatically reduce the hazardous air pollutants that are produced in their manufacturing operations, had a product that was fully cost-competitive with the existing product on the market with superior strength properties. So 
once this product was in the marketplace, um, not only had they seen excellent performance, but they had a competitive advantage. And that came because the state of California banned certain composite lumber products from use, manufacture, or shipment into the state of California. And all of a sudden, Columbia Forest Products has a big competitive advantage, and their competitors had to scramble to come up with alternatives. You all remember the Hurricane Katrina that hit um, New Orleans back in 2004? What did, what did FEMA do? They moved in a lot of trailers to take care of the people that lost their homes. Good intentions, unintended consequences, because these trailers were heavily loaded with composite lumber products. Shortly after people moved in, they began complaining about burning eyes, sore throats, and headaches. And what they found were there were very high levels of formaldehyde in these trailers from the composite wood products that were used to manufacture them. So by going with a soy-based adhesive, you can now supply formaldehyde-free products, which can improve the performance of the product and reduce the human health and environmental concerns associated with the previous generation of adhesives here. I'm going to walk you through an example of a drug synthesis just to show you how powerful the application of the principles of green chemistry could be. This is for a drug called pregabalin. Pregabalin is used for neuropathic pain, people that have problems with uh, pain from nerves. And the very first synthesis of this product is shown on this slide. You can see they start with a relatively simple starting material. It's an aldehyde. They go through multiple steps to achieve this, this uh, pregabalin product. What you need to know about the synthesis is that several steps used organic solvents, expensive, some concerns about human health for the environment. Number two, the transformation was done at elevated temperatures, which means they needed energy, which means greenhouse gases associated with the production of that energy. And the synthesis was not terribly efficient because they carried a mixture of products through. In nature, <clears throat> products occur in a left-handed and a right-handed form. Nature is smart enough to know the difference between the left hand and right hand, and nature tends to work with left-handed molecules. Right-handed molecules either don't work or they can be toxic. So by doing a synthesis where you have both present and you carry it through the entire synthetic sequence, you get a mixture at the end that you then have to put a lot of effort into separating left hand from right hand. And oh, by the way, that means half of your mixture is no longer good because the body can't use that. So that was the original synthesis. The E factor was 86. Remember, 86 kilograms of waste for every one kilogram of pregabalin that Pfizer synthesized. The new synthesis replaced the organic solvents with water, and they, they used um, biocatalysis, enzymes that occur in nature, which is how they're able to operate water, and they're able to do these operations now at room temperature instead of elevated temperatures. So now all the reactions conducted in water they can deal with the separation of the two-handed molecules right in the first step because nature, using this enzyme, knows how to separate left hand from right hand. The left hand goes through very high yield for the synthesis. The right hand, which has no value, can then be recovered and recycled so they can improve the overall yield of the process. And the E factor went from 86 to 12. That's a pretty, pretty good dramatic improvement. So if we just look at the energy involved here in the original process, 120 megajoules per kilogram of product. In the new process, 21 megajoules per kilogram of product. The key message is an 80 plus percent reduction in energy required to produce the same molecule. So Pfizer calls this a blockbuster drug. A blockbuster drug uh, is a billion dollars or sales or more each year. So Pfizer did an analysis and they said, well, if we have this drug on the market from 2007 to 2020, over the life of that drug, we will save 88% of all of the solvent that we use, don't need it, won't have to buy it, won't have to recycle or dispose of it, significant reduction in one of the key raw materials and a complete elimination of another raw material in the reaction, and some of the starting material efficiencies gone to 40% uh, uh, reduction. Bottom line on this is it's an excellent return on investment. That's what the ROI stands for. So when the chemist in the laboratory comes up with new green chemical pathways, he has to communicate to the leadership of his company, the CEOs and the CFOs, to make the decisions to put capital into the new technology and help them understand there's an excellent return on investment for green chemistry going forward. I'll give you another example of a consumer product. 
Procter & Gamble did an analysis called the life cycle analysis. Life cycle looks at the entire uh, lifespan of a product from raw material extraction to end of life disposal. And when they did that analysis, they did it across um, raw material extraction all the way to use in the home, consumer use, all the way to disposal. They did it for a variety of their products, from diapers to bathroom tissue to liquid dishwasher detergent to shampoo. And they looked at energy used in each one of these steps in the supply chain. And lo and behold, one product stuck out like a sore thumb. And if you look carefully, it says it was laundry detergent in the use phase. And when they dug into that a little bit further, what they found out is most people wash their clothes in hot water because we all believe that hot water is required to get our clothes clean. But there's an awful lot of energy required to heat that water up, and greenhouse gas is associated with the production of that energy. So what uh, P&G did was they took this information and they developed a brand new detergent called cold water tide in the U.S., Ariel in Europe, and, and they now formulated this in such a way that these detergents give just as good a cleaning as hot water detergents do, but you don't have to use all that energy. So if you were to switch all of your laundry on an annual basis to cold water tide, you could save $63 a year, right? Whoopee, $63 a year. That's not a very big incentive on an individual basis, but if you look at the big picture and you're committed to sustainability, you can see the impact. So, for example, if everybody in the U.S., if everybody in the U.S. were to switch to cold water tide, you would save 70 to 90 billion kilowatts of energy each year, and that's equivalent to avoiding the emissions of 34 million tons of carbon dioxide. That's a lot of CO2 that we could keep out of the atmosphere. In Europe, they did a study. At the beginning of this test market, only 2% of the people used cold water. Today, it's 23%, which avoids 58,000 metric tons of CO2. And in the Netherlands, when they started, 7% used cold water. Today, 52% now washing cold water. So on an integrated basis, big impacts in the reduction uh, on our uh, environmental impact. And it's all about shrinking our environmental footprint. Um, we won't go into a lot of details on this, but there's a company called uh, Metabolix that has genetically engineered a switchgrass to produce bioplastics in plant cells. So they grow this switchgrass, they harvest it, and in, inside these cells, these little white spheres are plastic nodules that they can then recover. So you've got a rapidly renewable resource, and it's a biopolymer, so it's biodegradable in the, in, the, uh, in the environment. So, you know, in the early days, <clears throat> we thought the Earth had infinite buffer capacity. And when Rachel Carson published her famous book, Silent Spring, in um, 1962, everybody became aware of some of the uh, implications of environmental contamination. And people stepped back and said, well, the solution to pollution is dilution. Pump it into the air, pump it into the ocean. We don't see it. We forget about it. It's not there. Well, the fact is scientists know that the first law of thermodynamics says you can't destroy matter. You can interconvert matter with energy. That's Einstein's equation, but you can't destroy it. The second law of thermodynamics says is all material disperses. So we may not see it, we may have forgotten about it, but in fact, most of the pollutants that we put into the environment since the industrial age began are still out there somewhere if they haven't biodegraded to an extent. So let's talk a little bit about what is green. Green is a relative term. Uh, you don't have to meet all the principles of green chemistry to be green. If you don't have any today and you do one tomorrow, you've made your first step on that journey toward ultimate sustainability. If you could do three a year from now, you're better off than one today. The bottom line is we strive to be greener in everything that we do. We do not want to let perfect get in the way of good enough. If you've got an idea, let's try it. I said at the beginning, we won't get all the answers correct the first time. You do an experiment. If it works, you keep going. If it doesn't work, you take a step back, learn from it, and try something different going forward. So let me shift gears as we kind of bring this to a close, and let me tell you about the Institute in Washington. Our mission is pretty simple. It's to catalyze and enable the implementation of green chemistry and engineering across the entire uh, chemical enterprise around the world. It's, a, it's a, um, a very bold mission and one for which 
it requires a team effort. So we work with people around the world to accomplish this. We work in four primary areas. The first is education, and there's two parts to it. The first part is helping the students of today learn the new tools and techniques of green chemistry and engineering for application in the real world when they graduate. The second is to inform the research community about where the needs are for new green chemistry and engineering tools going forward so these can be developed and invented. We work in the area of advocacy, which means we work with federal, state, and international governments to try to get them to support legislation that enables and catalyzes the uh, implementation of green chemistry into the industrial sector. Obviously, we're talking a lot with industry to convince them that there's a myth, and the myth is that green chemistry has to cost more. In fact, I think I've given you several examples where you can save money and achieve competitive advantage in the marketplace through the implementation of green chemistry. And then finally, we're working in the area of certification. You are, you're probably familiar with things like the consumer reports where they rate you know, good, better, best, or underwriter laboratories. We're developing the first voluntary standard for greener chemicals and greener manufacturing processes to make those chemicals going forward. We hope to have that standard out in the marketplace by the end of the third quarter of this year. And why do we do that? Well, obviously, we're trying to reduce the environmental footprint for all the things that we have to deliver for an expanding society and reduce our overall impact on the biosphere because this is the only choice we have going forward. The Institute runs the premier annual conference. This will be our 14th year in Washington coming up. Um, wow, that's, that's an old slide. The theme is innovation and application of green chemistry. You're welcome to go to that website. It stands for Green Chemistry and Engineering, gcne.org. There is a student workshop taking place that week, and there are scholarships available to attend. I think there's still time to apply if you're interested. Uh, you can network with and hear from the leading green scientists around the world at this conference. We publish a bi-monthly newsletter called The Nexus. If you'd like to get on the distribution, just send a note to gci at acs.org. It goes to over 5,000 green chemists and engineers around the world today. Uh, we do participate with the Environmental Protection Agency to um, recognize Presidential Green Chemistry Challenge Award winners on an annual basis. Since the award's inception back in 1995, there have been 72 presidential awards given in the area of green chemistry. Many, many of those awards have gone to corporations that have reduced green chemistry to practice. I always tell people that they don't do that unless they're going to make money at it. So we got great examples where people see the value, the business value in implementing green chemistry. For every one award that's given, we get five applications. So you can see there's a lot going on in the world of green chemistry today. Uh, we also offer at the ACS the Affordable Green Chemistry Award uh, for, for people that have advanced green chemistry in the, in the industrial sector as well. So I would like to wrap things up by stimulating your thinking once again and say that we have many, many challenging problems to tackle on this planet going forward, one of which is energy. And there are many ways to produce energy, but I would submit to you that we have an unlimited source of free energy that sits eight and a half minutes away from this planet at the speed of light, and it's called the sun. Every hour on this planet, every hour, the sun delivers enough energy to the surface of the earth to meet the entire needs of this planet for one full year. Our best efficiency for commercially available solar voltaics today is between 8 and 12 percent. I'm here to tell you, especially the young people, there are Nobel Prizes, there are wonderful contributions to mankind for tackling the problems associated with sustainability, coming up with innovative new ideas and reducing those ideas to practice going forward. I'd like to conclude by saying I believe green chemistry and engineering is the key to a sustainable future. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to be here, but more importantly, offer you the opportunity to ask me questions or challenge me on anything I've said tonight. And in the interest of it being late and after dinner, I tried my best to keep this to 45 minutes. So thanks for the opportunity. <clears throat> oh. So the question about ionic liquids is an interesting one. When ionic liquids first were, were developed, um, 
there was a great, there's great hope that ionic liquids would be relatively benign alternative solvents for transformation because everything can't be done in water, okay, at least not today. Um, but like anything else, as we peel the onion and we see all the details emerge, some of these materials are fairly innocuous. Others do have some adverse health effects. So it's really important to avoid what I'll call unintended consequences. We come up with new materials. We think they're better than what we had. So we start producing them in large quantities and we put them out in the marketplace. And three years, five years, ten years down the road, all of a sudden we find out there's some unintended consequences of things we didn't know. So I think as the field of mechanistic toxicology advances, we need to be smarter about asking some of these uh, questions before we scale up and commercialize materials going forward. But yes, ionic liquids have, have properties that, that offer some real advantages in certain applications. Qu question? Okay, we'll get back to uh, Dr. Peoples, uh, thanks, first of all, for a wonderful presentation. I wonder if you might comment, uh, you were showing the uh, slide regarding the, uh, the uh, tide and the cold water, and I would, I would like for you to comment about the cost of energy, and I would assume that probably in most of those countries where the adoption rate was higher, that probably energy costs were much higher, and, and <coughs> what we have to face in America with regard to, uh, you know, cost driving us toward uh, being more environmentally friendly and also more energy efficient? Sure. Well, I, I think clearly there is an element of awareness and education here. I mean, it, it, if it costs you exactly the same, but this is better for the environment, I think a good percentage of our population would say, well, gee, you know, I'm not losing anything. I'm not paying a penalty in, in efficiency or cost. Why not do the right thing from an environmental point of view? Will it take a long time for, to make that transition? Absolutely. Do I think our energy uh, industry is subsidized at this point in time? Yes, I don't think we pay the true cost of energy, and I think we're going we're to see the reality of that come into play as things like carbon uh, tax or cap and trade CO2 limitations uh, manifest themselves in the marketplace going forward. One has to only compare the cost of gasoline or diesel fuel in Europe today versus in the U.S., and you can see that you know we, we, we have a, we've been subsidized for a long time. We don't think about the environmental consequences or build that into the price. You know, I think everybody today accepts that you pay somewhere between one and six dollars for every new tire you buy to recycle the old tire, right? When you get your oil change on your car, you're paying a couple bucks, in some places up to $10 to recycle the oil. And the same thing with lead acid batteries. Now you're starting to see this in electronics. You're going to see more and more legislation that mandates covering the cost for recovery and recycle of these materials to keep them out of the landfill and to keep them out of our environments from contaminating the water and, and the air and such. Uh, you Sorry, I took my surprise. Uh, you showed various uh, examples of re-engineering synthesis to give better products and better yields. <clears throat> Do you have any examples of maybe an inorganic process? Uh, yeah. There's, well, first of all, um, it's a good observation. Organic processes, especially when it comes to uh, specialty chemicals and drugs, tend to be very big, complex operations. So it's a high leverage area for the application of green chemistry when it was getting started. Now we know more. It's easier to pass this down into other areas. So, for example, there's a company that's in the water treatment industry using some inorganic materials. They uh, found that they could they could more efficiently manage uh, boiler water and, and as a result uh, would have lower sales of the materials that they're in business to, to make and make a profit with. So the business people came to the scientists and said, what are you doing? We make money by selling more, not selling less. But the, the discussion about sustainability and do what's right for the planet led to an investigation and a brand new business model. And the new business model was this. We'll approach the company and we'll offer the company to manage all of their boiler water uh, chemistry. As a result, we will make more money managing it for them, but, but even though we're going to sell less chemicals and this company has the benefit of doing the right thing from an from a environmental point of view. So it was an example of a win-win application in that particular case. You mentioned earlier the certification program. Uh, will that be something that we as consumers will be able to <clears throat> look for as we purchase items? 
I think what you will see in the chemical standard that we're talking about, first version of the standard would be what we call B2B, business to business. So a basic manufacturer of chemicals will do business with someone that buys that chemical to produce a new product or a formulation. And what that, that user wants to do is they want to be able to compare on an apples to apples basis their different choices as they manufacture this new product. They may choose to use that certification issue when they put that product out in the marketplace for the consumer. But that will probably come in a next generation version of the standard down the road. One of the challenges that we really face is that how do you convey complex uh, technical information to different audiences? So if you're talking to engineers and scientists, you can get into a lot of details. If you're talking to the consumer that has no technical background whatsoever, you've got to keep it very simple and straightforward. For me, the analogy is food labeling. So if I go to the store and I want to buy yogurt, I look at a couple different kinds of yogurt, and I look on the back, I look at how much calories, what's the weight in the container, I look at the total amount of fat, and I look at the total amount of sugar, and then I make my choice as an informed consumer. I'm able to do that because a standard format has been provided, and standard units of information are there for me to make that judgment. That's the first step in the chemical standard we're trying to put together for the B2B side of it. How we translate that information to the consumer yet, we're, we're not really quite sure. <coughs> Any other questions? Observations. Everybody agree with everything I said? Can we have one last question? Anyone? Got one over here. Just for the sake of the honors people in the audience. Uh, the Irish people? Honors. Oh, honors people. I'm sorry. sorry. No, no offense to any Irish people. <laughs> I but, thought this was going to be your beer question or something. I wasn't sure. Uh, may, uh, you want to stick around maybe later. But, uh, <laughs> uh, based on current trends, do you think sustainability will be obtained before it's too late? Will, will be attained? Attained. <clears throat> well, I suppose attained is a very bad word, but do you think we're, we will get to the point where we can sustain all this? You know, I'm an optimist. Okay, so I believe that, that we, mankind will do what's necessary to solve these problems. The, the concern would be how rapidly we're going to do that. I think the technology exists today, and I would ask anybody in the audience to challenge me if you disagree with that. I believe the technology exists today to make huge strides in reducing the environmental footprint of mankind on this planet and on our biosphere. I believe the real hurdles that we face are political and, and to some extent maybe geographical, but clearly political issues. You know, we've had the Kyoto Protocol, for which the United States decided not to ratify. We've had um, the most recent meetings in, um, where was it, help me out, over in the Netherlands, uh, Copenhagen. Thank you very much. I think Copenhagen was a big disappointment, you know. A lot of hype before it, and nothing of real material impact has come out of it yet. There's a lot of behind-the-scenes discussions taking place. But, you know, when you look around at what's going on with respect to coal-fired power plants coming online, new cars coming online, you look, look at the new evidence coming from mechanistic toxicology about what's happening to um, uh, uh, advanced uh, mammalian systems, um, I think the evidence is really clear. You look at the fisheries around the world, which is a primary source of protein for a lot of people, that have been absolutely decimated, which will take decades to recover if they recover, and it's becoming obvious that, you know, we cannot meet the needs of a growing population on this planet who expect to increase the level of their standard of living using the technology we've got today. Nature has a way of... Um, bringing things back into balance. So if we push the biosphere too far out of balance, nature will find a way to bring it back. You know, there are the, some people that feel like we will have some kind of a plague at some point in time, which has the potential to reduce the population on this planet by 30 or 40 percent. I hope we're smart enough to avoid that from happening by taking the appropriate steps. Uh, you know, that's a big philosophical debate we could have. But I still choose to be an optimist and say to you, I think the odds are pretty good that we can make this happen going forward. We just need the, the right leadership to make that happen. You know, we need another um, space program. 
You know, John Kennedy in 1962 said before the end of the decade, we're going to put a man on the moon and bring him back safely before the end of the decade, okay? And we did that. We need that kind of visionary leadership going forward, and, and I don't think we've had it since that point in time. Somebody will emerge. Well, listen, um, I didn't know where Martin, Tennessee was uh, until I looked it up on the map, and I have to tell you, it's been a real pleasure to be here and uh, to spend some time with you tonight. I hope I've convinced you that, um, that the science of green chemistry and engineering is real and has a real potential to have a huge impact on this planet going forward, and I hope you'll support us in that effort going forward. Whether you're a, whether you're a chemist, engineer, biologist, nursing major, business major, it doesn't matter. There's only one planet, and we need to fix it. So thank you.